In the last lecture, uh, we began our discussion of the harmonic oscillator. So we wrote down the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator in terms of uh, p square and x square. The, the Hamiltonian for the harmonic oscillator, as you know, is just p square plus x square. And we recognize that this is a factorizable Hamiltonian. This is a very special case of Hamiltonian. And these Hamiltonians are, these kinds of Hamiltonians are rare to come by. Um, so we took advantage of the fact that this Hamiltonian is factorizable Hamiltonian, which can be written in terms of uh, x plus ip and x minus ip. And correspondingly, we uh, did a change of variables if, uh, if you want. Uh, we defined an two new linear operators in terms of x and p, right? We call them a and a dagger. We don't yet know what these operators do. We know what x does and we know what p does. We, we, we don't know yet what a and a dagger do, but what we could uh, simply blindly do is calculate what the commutation relation between a and a dagger is, assuming the commutation relation between x and p. And we find that a and a dagger obviously do not commute because they are functions of x and p and x and p do not commute. So we cannot expect a and a dagger to be uh, commuting. Uh, and a and a dagger are also not Hermitian uh, operators because the Hermitian conjugate of a is a dagger, which is a different operator than a. Okay. Okay. So that's the first thing we did. And then we rewrote the Hamiltonian, which was initially in terms of x square and p square in terms of a and a dagger. And we got the Hamil Hamiltonian that I have, I'm showing you in the green box, right? So we got h bar omega zero times a dagger a plus one half. So this is the uh, Hamiltonian that we now need to understand and uh, whose eigenvalues and eigenvectors we now have to figure out. But we recognize that this Hamiltonian is basically a function of the operator a dagger a. Right? So if I know everything about the operator A dagger A, I know everything about the Hamiltonian because the other piece in the Hamiltonian, which is just plus one half, is a diagonal piece. So that is very easy to figure out. So if I, if I understand what the eigenvalues of A dagger A are, I know what the eigenvalues of H are, basically. So I proceeded to look at the operator A dagger A, which I suggestively called N. So now the eigenvalue problem of uh, h is reduced to the eigenvalue problem for n. Okay. Now we have to still understand um, what a and a dagger do to the eigenfunctions of n. Remember that since a and a dagger do not commute, there is no reason to expect that a and a dagger commute with n because they don't commute with uh, each other and n is a function of a and a dagger. So we can go ahead and figure out what the commutation relations between n and a are and n and a dagger are, which is what we uh, computed in the last lecture, and this is where we stopped. So this was a quick reminder to let you know where we are. So we have to uh, continue from this stage and figure out the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of n or equivalently the operator h, which is the Hamiltonian. Does anyone have any questions uh, about any of the things that we have uh, talked about till now? <clears throat> okay. So if there are no more questions, if there are no questions rather, uh, we will proceed. So the first thing that we have to understand is that now we have the eigenvalue equation n phi n equals some uh, n phi n. And right now I'm not assuming anything about n. It will later turn out that n can only be an integer, but that is not apparent at all from uh, the discussions up till now, because obviously n is a function of a and a dagger, which is a function of x and p, so there is no integers anywhere to be seen. All right, so I want to understand how a and a dagger act on phi n. So how do a and a dagger act on phi n? Why am I interested in this question? Well, the first thing that uh, comes to mind is that now, now that you have a Hermitian operator, which is n or h, you know that the eigenfunctions of a Hermitian operator can be used as a complete basis because they're automatically orthogonal to each other, right? So uh, phi corresponding to two different n values would be uh, zero when you compute the dot product between those two functions. So, it is clear that since we are dealing with Hermitian operators, we are dealing with phi n's, which can be used as a basis. 
Now, in this basis, I want to understand how the other operators act, and that will give me an idea about the construction of the Hilbert space. Okay, so what are the different vectors here, and how do I go from one vector to, to the other, and things like that. Uh, when I talk about angular momentum in the next uh, semester, we will follow a very similar construction. We'll first understand what the basis set is, and then ask what are the other operators in, in the system, and how do these operators act on the basis set. Okay. All right, so let us figure out how A and A dagger act on phi n. Of course, I cannot really go ahead and ask what is this, right? Uh, and my computer is really misbehaving today. I'm sorry about that. I'll reshare. Okay, so I cannot straight away ask the question because I don't even know what phi n is. Phi n is right, so I have to do about do this in an indirect fashion to understand how a acts on phi n. Um, let me ask, how does n act on the state a phi n? Why? Well, I know how n acts on phi n, and I know the commutation relations between n and a. So this is a question that I can answer. So let me ask. Suppose if I act A on the basis functions phi n and I get a new function and a new, a new function, whatever that is, how does n act on this function? Again, the, I cannot straight away write down what the answer is because I don't know what the phi n's are, but I can employ a trick. I can employ the trick that we derived last class that the commutation relation of n and A is nothing but minus A. This comes in very handy because now I can write n acting on a phi n. Obviously, this relation means n a minus a n equals minus a. So I can write the operator combination n a in terms of the operator combination a n. How would I write this? This is equal to a n minus a acting on phi n, okay? Now, immediately I can make some progress because I know what n acting on phi n is. n acting on phi n is simply n times phi n as per equation one that I've written down here. So I can write this equation as n a phi n minus a phi n, okay? So if, if uh, this is going too fast, please stop me at any stage. So what do I have here? I have the fact that the, num uh, the n operator acting on the state a phi n is giving me n minus one a phi n. Okay. Now let's call this equation two. I don't know what a phi n is, but I do know something very interesting. Suppose if I did not know anything at all about how, what a phi n is, I would simply assume that a phi n, if you did not know anything about a, a dagger, or how they commute or the commutation relation with n, I will write A acting on phi n is some linear combination J, um, Bj, phi j. is some linear combination b n phi m, right? Why? Because I know A is a linear operator. So if it acts on some state, it should give me a linear combination of the states. This is all I know. I know that phi n are basis vectors, basis functions rather, and I know that a linear operator acting on a basis function or any function in general would give me a linear combination of all the basis functions. This is the most general answer I can think of. And now I, I would need to figure out what the different BMs are. 
But given that I know what this commutation relation is, I know exactly that n acting on the state a phi n is giving me n minus 1 a phi n. If you stare at equations 1 and equation 2, you can quickly, easily uh, satisfy yourself that the state a phi n, whatever that state is, is also an eigenfunction of n. And this has an eigenvalue n minus 1, right? So if phi n is an eigenfunction of n with eigenvalue n, then a phi n is also an eigenfunction of n with eigenvalue n minus 1. Okay, now this is the first piece of evidence that we have uh, that tells us that there has to be some integers flowing around because I seem to change my n values in units of 1. Obviously, you can easily figure out that if um, I calculate what a squared phi n is, and if I act n on the state a squared phi n, I would actually get n minus 2 a squared phi n, and so on and so forth. So if phi n is characterized by some n, then the state a phi n is characterized by some number n minus 1, and the state a squared phi n is characterized by some uh, number n minus 2, and so on and so forth. So if I imagine some state n, right, with some uh, integer value n, then it seems that I can go to some other state, excuse me, some other state, some other state, some other state, and I can keep going this way. And this state is characterized by n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3. I have to simply keep acting A on the parent state. If I keep act, if I act A on the parent state n, I get a state which is characterized by n minus 1. If I act it by A squared, I get n minus 2, and so on and so forth. So A seems to change the state phi to another state which is characterized by 1n less. Okay, that is the first lesson that we learned. So now let us look at the equivalent uh, statements about the operator A dag. Again, since I don't know what phi n is, I really cannot answer what A dagger phi n is. I would again assume that A dagger phi n is some other linear combinations of the phi n. But now I can use the commutation relations and I can write and use the commutation relation n A dagger is simply A dagger. So n A dagger minus A dagger n is just A dagger. So I can ask what n acting on the state A dagger phi n is, and you can easily guess where I'm going with this. And this is equal to A dagger n plus A dagger acting on phi n. And n acting on phi n is just n times phi n. So this gives me n plus 1 A dagger phi n. So just like the operator A reduces the state by one number, n to n minus one, and so on and so forth, the operator A dagger seems to increase the state from n to n plus one, and n plus one to n plus two, and so on and so forth. Again, you can quickly verify yourself that n acting on A dagger square phi n would simply be equal to n plus two. A dagger squared phi n. Okay, so just like we interpreted a phi n also also an eigenfunction of uh, n, we can also interpret that a dagger phi n is also an eigenfunction of n with eigenvalue n plus one. Okay. So just like we seem to be going down,
by the repeated application of the operator A, I can now build an entire ladder. So suppose if I have a state N, I can go up by acting with a dagger and I can go down by acting with A. So this is my state and this is, if I repeatedly apply A, I will go to the state characterized by N minus one, N minus two, N minus three and so on. And this is n plus one, n plus two, n plus three, and so on. And to go here, I need to act by a dagger. Okay. So for this particular reason, a is called the lowering operator, and a dagger is called the raising operator. It raises my eigenvalue by an amount plus one. Similarly, a reduces my eigenvalue by an amount minus one. And since this, these states span the space, I can now understand that each state is indeed characterized by an integer number n. Okay, so this is what tells me that this n that I started with has to be an integer number, has to be an integer. Okay, why? Because there are no states between n and n minus one, otherwise I'll be able to find any other operator that takes me from n to n minus 0.5. Since there is no other operator, I'll have to conclude that this Hilbert space is made up of states characterized by integer numbers, and I can go up or down by repeated application of a dagger and a. Okay, so to answer the question that we raised initially, suppose if I did not know anything about A or A dagger or the commutation relations, I simply have to write down the action of A phi n as a linear combination of all the phi n's. But now I know that A acting on phi n has to be proportional to the state phi n minus one because that is the state characterized by the number n minus one. And I also know that A dagger phi n has to be proportional to the state phi n plus one because that is the state characterized by the number n plus one, okay? So just by using the commutation relations and asking what is the value of n on the states a phi n and a dagger phi n, we are able to get quite far in this problem. We have been able to conclude that the action of a on phi n is not to give you a linear combination of all the phi's, but it is to give you only one specific phi characterized by one number lower than what you start with. Okay, so I can write this as an equality relation. A phi n is some C n phi n minus one. Okay, now it is very convenient in this problem at this point to switch to the Dirac notation because each state is characterized by a number n instead of calling phi n. I can also switch to the Dirac notation and I will call the eigenkets as characterized by the number n, okay? So all I'm saying, so these equations that I've just written down, I can rewrite as A acting on the state n would be some C n minus one, okay? And A dagger acting on the state n would be some D n n plus one. I need to figure out what Cn and Dn are, but I also know that since these states are orthogonal to each other because they are the eigenkets of a Hermitian operator, the Hamiltonian, I know that n n prime has to be delta n n prime, which means they have to be, it has to be equal to zero if n is not equal to n prime and one if n equals n prime, okay? So using this fact, so could you repeat the reason why n is always an integer? Very good, okay. See, our job is to understand what these states are, right? I want to understand what the uh, eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian are equivalent to the eigenfunctions of the number operator are. So I have concluded that, so where is, uh, right here. I've concluded that uh, once I know what the eigenfunctions of n are, I'm basically done because uh, the Hamiltonian is very simply related to the number operator. 
So my job is to figure out what these phi n's are. I still have not told you what the phi n's are. That will come towards the end of this lecture, hopefully. But I can start constructing the Hilbert space. I can start un uh, getting an idea of what are the kinds of states that are there in the Hilbert space. To understand this, what do I do? See, typically in a linear vector space, go back to your initial, uh, uh, initial uh, few lectures in this course of, of what you learned in linear vector spaces. <clears throat> You first write down, <clears throat> excuse me, what the basis vectors are, right? And once you know what the basis vectors are, once you fix a particular basis vector, which is not sacred, as I have repeatedly told you, you can choose any basis you want. You ask, what is the action of operators, linear operators on this basis set, okay? Because any vector can be written as a linear combination of the basis set. Once you understand how an operator acts on the basis vectors, you know how an operator acts on any vector. So what are the operators floating around? Well, my basis vectors in this case are eigenvectors of n. And since this is an infinite dimensional vector space, I should say the basis functions of n, right? The other operators floating around are a and a dagger. And now I have to understand how a acts on the basis functions and a dagger acts on the basis functions. Now, since I have not really uh, went the differential equation route and I know what the functions are, which is a very legitimate way of solving this problem. And I will assign this as a reading problem to all of you. I will uh, use a small trick to figure out what a phi n and a, a dagger phi n are. I find that if I act n on the state a phi n, I get n minus one times a phi n. So look at equation two, right? Now, I already know that phi n is an eigenfunction of the n operator with eigenvalue n. And now I have deduced using the commutation relations that a phi n is also an eigenfunction of n with eigenvalue n minus 1. Now, since uh, this is a Hermitian operator and I can diagonalize this perfectly, no problem at all, I already know what is the eigenfunction corresponding to the eigenvalue n minus 1 because if n phi n is n minus 1 phi n obviously this means that n phi n minus 1 is n minus 1 phi n minus 1 right so i know that a phi n the state a phi n should be some multiple of the state phi n minus 1 because i know that when n acts on it i get n minus 1 and there can be only one state which has eigenvalue n minus one, and that is the state phi n minus one, okay? So this simple observation tells me that, excuse me, that this relation that I've written down uh, here has to be true. That a phi n has to be proportional to phi n minus one, okay? And now I can do a square phi n and ask what is n acting on a square phi n, and I will get phi n minus two. And then I can keep going like this, phi n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, and so on and so forth. And similarly, if I act a dagger, I keep going up from phi n, I go to phi n plus 1, phi n plus 2, phi n plus 3, and so on and so forth. So it seems that the action of the operators in this Hilbert space is to change the state, which is characterized by a number n, to a number n plus 1, and to a number n plus 2 it seems that there is only a discrete jump in the states, okay? There is no fractional jump, so there is no fractions here. If I act a phi n, I get the state which is n minus one, not n minus 0.3 or n minus 0.7, right? That will be a fractional number, but I keep going in steps of one. And since I always go to some other state, which is an integer uh, number different from the original state that I start with, I can conclude that the number n that I started with is actually an integer, okay? If there is any more questions, please ask. Okay, so now I'm switching to the Dirac notation and I'm writing these eigenkets as m. And, uh, and this, is, this is something that I'm sure everyone is comfortable with, okay? All right, so let us call this equation three and equation four. Okay, now look at equation three. Now let me take the Hermitian conjugate of equation three. What is the Hermitian conjugate of equation three? Well, I have to convert the kets to brass. I have to convert numbers to complex conjugates and I have to con uh, convert operators to the adjoints. So this would be M 
a dagger equals c n star n minus 1. So let's call this equation 5. And I will simply multiply equation 3 and equation 5. What is this? This is equal to n a dagger times equation 3 is a n equals c n star c n n minus 1 n minus 1. And since these states are normalized properly, this guy is just 1. Okay, from this relation. Okay. So this tells me an a dagger a is just the number operator and which is just n and n acting on n is just n. So this tells me left hand side is n and n equals mod c n squared. And for the exact same reason, this is also equal to one because these states are normalized properly. And this tells you that the constant of proportionality, mod, mod of the constant of proportionality is just n. And without any uh, contradiction, I can choose cn to be a real quantity. And I'll write cn as root n. Okay. Now there is no reason to, I can also include a phase factor here of e to the i theta. Cn I can write as square root of n e to the i theta, but I choose not to, to keep things simple. Okay. So using very simple properties of orthogonality, I'm able to deduce that A acting on N should be equal to square root of N, N minus one. Okay. And using very similar arguments, you should show, so again, homework, what is BN? I encourage all of you to figure out what dn is. I'm sure you can look it up, but try to do it on your own. If you have not done this before, it's a good exercise to do. Okay, dn is the constant of proportionality in equation four. Again, do the exact same thing. Um, so you simply take the complex conjugate of equation four, multiply it, and then use the orthogonality relationships. Can you explain again why we assumed Cn to be real? There is no uh, reason as such. So notice that if mod Cn squared is n, I can choose Cn to be, for example, e to the i theta, right? And I can also write now a n, a acting on n is e to the i theta square root of n, n minus one. There is nothing wrong with this as such because in all observables, um, this e to the i theta will drop out because n is a dagger a. And if I choose to include this phase factor in the eigenfunctions of n, there will be no change because a will give me a factor of e to the i theta, a dagger will give me a factor of e to the minus i theta and everything will go away. Okay. Uh, so just for simplicity, I've chosen this to be completely real. So you will again encounter the exact same problem in your angular momentum discussion. And in the angular momentum case, which is a very similar problem, uh, some people do choose these phase factors, okay? Uh, I think this is called the short key convention or something like that. But yeah, there is uh, no uh, real reason to carry this factor of it to the i theta. So for simplicity, simplicity sake, I'm choosing cn to be real. Okay, so what is, the, what is the picture that has emerged? The picture that has emerged thus far is that the n operator, the Hermitian operator n, has eigenvalues which are integers n. And whose eigenkits are simply labeled by the integer number n. Okay. All right. So now what about the Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian is h bar omega 0 n plus 1 half. Right. Obviously, the Hamiltonian compute, commutes with n because the Hamiltonian is basically proportional to n. So h acting on n should be equal to h bar omega 0, n plus 1 half acting on n, which means, which means that the n's are also the eigenkets of the Hamiltonian with eigenvalue h bar omega 0 times n plus 1 half. 
Okay, so this is how we conclude that the energy eigenvalues E n are n plus one half h bar omega z. Okay, so I'm sure this is something you've seen many times before, but still this is a very important relation, so I will write it in boxes. So the energy eigenvalues of the states, as you keep increasing n, keep increasing by the factor n plus one half, okay? Now, which is the lowest state? Well, the lowest state should correspond to n equal to zero. Well, why not n negative? Well, we have only said that n is an integer, so why can't it be a negative integer? Well, it cannot be a negative integer because remember, the Hamiltonian that we start with is p squared plus x squared. Okay. So, uh, forgetting some factors uh, overall. Or I can write it exactly, but I don't want to. This is the sum of two squares of Hermitian operators, right? Which means that if I take the um, expectation value of h on any state, this has to be always greater than or equal to zero because a Hamiltonian is a sum of squares of two Hermitian operators, positive definite operators. If h is a, a function of positive definite operators, there is no way uh, that uh, this positive definite operator can act on a state and give me a negative number. So the uh, average value of h when you compute with any state has to be greater than or equal to zero, which means that at most n should be from this energy eigenvalue, we can conclude that n should be greater than minus one half, okay? Which means the lowest integer state is n equal to zero. So the lowest state, lowest state or the ground state, the ground state is the state with the least energy is characterized by energy E zero equals one half H bar omega zero, okay? The first excited state has energy E1, which is one plus one half h bar omega zero, which is three half h bar omega zero. The state two obviously has phi half h bar omega zero, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the construction that emerges. The construction that emerges is a series of states characterized by some integer number n such that, <coughs> excuse me, such that, um, so if I draw a picture, I can, be, I can keep going up from the state zero, state one, state two, state three, and the energies of these guys are one half h bar omega, 3 half h bar omega, phi half h bar omega, and so on and so forth. Okay, the difference between adjacent energy levels is a constant, excuse me, wrong color, E n plus one minus E n is equal to n plus one plus one half h bar omega minus n plus one half h bar omega, which is equal to h bar omega. So the difference between the states is a constant, the difference in energy level. So these states are all equally spaced in terms of energy, okay? So is there a limit on n? Well, obviously there is a lower limit on n, but there is no upper limit on n, okay? So what is the lower limit on n? Well, n cannot be less than zero, which means if I start with some state n and I apply the A operator, I go to the state n minus one. And I can keep applying A operator and keep going to the states n minus two, n minus three, n minus four, blah, blah, blah. But once I get to the state zero, I cannot go down the ladder any further, which means I should have the condition that A acting on the lowest state should identically be equal to zero. I have to demand this. 
okay if i don't demand this then i can keep going down in energy with, with more and more negative values and there will be no ground state for the system and that's a huge problem right if you don't have a ground state and if there is an infinite energy uh, available then if you have any particle it will keep radiating energy and fall to the lower and lower and lower energy states and it it will it will emit infinite amount of energy out and that is an unstable system and since we know that uh, we don't have such unstable systems we have to truncate the series at n equal to 0 so we have to impose by hand the condition that the uh, the lowering operator a acting on the ground state should be identically equal to 0 remember that i am not saying this is equal to the state 0 that's an eigen value equation i am saying that this is equal to the number 0 okay it cannot give us anything else okay so uh, the next step in this construction is now that we have uh, gotten an intuitive understanding of how the states look like uh, we have to understand what the wave functions are so remember that if a particle goes from the state 3 to state 2 it emits radiation uh, with energy h bar omega 0 okay if it goes from state 3 to state 1 it emits radiation with energy 2 h bar omega 0 and so on and so forth and there is a lower limit on n but there is no upper limit on n okay there can be as many uh, they, you can have a state with as many n's as possible okay so we have to understand uh, what this picture physically means but before we understand what this picture physically means i want to do a fun exercise and tell you the difference between two kinds of uh, particles in the universe okay so this is aside this is not the main development but i want to show you that you might be actually used to this used to the fact that you know uh, you can create states with arbitrary number of n and you might be thinking that what what's the big deal in all of these things this is all something that we have already seen before but so as i have repeatedly stressed all this relies on the power of the commutation relations that we started with remember that all of this has to do with the power of the commutation relations that told us that a a dagger equals one okay and similarly a excuse me obviously a and a dagger commute with themselves so this has to be equal to zero so the hamiltonian which is equal to hamiltonian which is the function of a dagger a is constructed out of operators that have a fundamental commutation relation between them okay so to illustrate the power of the commutation relation and to show you that uh, belaboring this fact is not just uh, uh, some idle fun on my part let us do a fun exercise suppose i write down some other operator some other hamiltonian which i write as b dagger b okay and I will assume that instead of commutation relations, these B daggers have anti commutation relations. B B dagger equals 1 and B B equal to B dagger B dagger equal to 0. Okay. Now, obviously, these Bs cannot be composed of Xs and Ps because Xs and Ps have commutation relations. So these Bs are some other weird operators. I don't care about what these operators are. But suppose if somebody gives me an operator, which is the Hamiltonian operator, and they say that, well, look, I have a raising operator B dagger and I have a lowering operator B, but instead of your usual uh, harmonic oscillator, they don't uh, follow commutation relations, but they follow anti-commutation relations. Okay, and then they ask you, can you please diagonalize this Hamiltonian for me and tell me what the Hilbert space looks like? Okay, now this looks like a very difficult problem, but it is not. We can actually follow the exact same steps. Okay, so let us actually look at it. So instead of calling this Hamiltonian, let me call it the number operator. Okay, and I'll put a subscript F here because I want to distinguish this number operator from the number operator that we have discussed up till now. So let me again assume that everything that I just discussed also holds true. What's the big deal commutation, anti-commutation? So I'll, I'll assume that my states are still given by some integer n, 
where n can go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I can have any number as I want, right? And I will assume that B dagger acting on n should give me the state n plus 1, and so on and so forth, okay? But there should be an alarm bell sounding right away. Why? Because if it is an anti-commutation relation, look at this commutation, anti-commutation relation. This is B dagger B plus B dagger B equal to zero, which tells you that B dagger square is equal to zero. Our A dagger square was not equal to zero. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, let us actually look at this number operator in a little bit more detail. Let us say that NF acting on N gives me M times N. Okay, now let us ask what is NF square acting on N? And you would say, this is silly. It has to be n squared. Well, let's find out. So this is equal to nf squared is equal to b dagger b whole square acting on n, right? So this is equal to b dagger b, b dagger b acting on n. But if you use the anti-commutation relations, I can write b b dagger plus b dagger b equals one. That is this anti-commutation relation that I have here. Okay, which means I can write b b dagger as b dagger times one minus b dagger b times b, oh, I used the wrong color. Sorry about that. This is equal to b dagger times one minus b dagger b times b acting on n, okay? This is exactly same as what I did before for my original harmonic oscillator, which had commutation relations. But now, since b dagger square is equal to zero and b square is also equal to zero, the second term drops out because the second term is b dagger square times b square. So this is simply equal to b dagger b acting on n. And this is nothing but n affecting on n. Okay? So n f square acting on n, which you would assume is n square acting on n, is actually just equal to n acting on n, which tells me that n square minus n acting on these states is zero, or n into n minus one acting on these states is zero. Which tells me something extremely fundamental in, in physics, not just in quantum mechanics. It tells you that the eigenvalues of this number operator, n, cannot be anything that you want. They can only be zero or one. Okay, have you seen this in your life before? Can anyone unmute and tell me what it is that we are doing, all this mathematics, based on the final, final result that n can only be zero and one? Anybody? Eigenvalue of function. Eigenvalue? Projection. Kronecker delta, that is one guess. So now we accepted this n as a number. The first harmonic oscillator is telling me that in a state I can have any number. The second harmonic oscillator is telling me that the state can have zero number or one number. Have we studied something called the Pauli exclusion principle? Yes or no? So if you remember, or if you remember the definition or the statement of the Pauli exclusion principle, it tells you that if you have electrons, you cannot have two electrons in the same state that have identical quantum numbers. Okay, you can have a state with zero electron, or you can have a state with one electron, but you cannot have a state with two electrons. That is what this harmonic oscillator is telling you. It's telling you that the state is characterized by n equal to zero number or n equal to one number but not two, because I cannot act B dagger square 
starting with the state zero. I can act b dagger on zero and get one, but since b dagger square is equal to zero, this, this Hilbert space is characterized in complete contrast to the original state by just two states. The zero state and the one state and nothing else. There is nothing else above. There is no way to go above. There is no way to go below. There is only two states. Okay, what we've essentially derived is the Pauli exclusion principle. So what does in it, all of this has to do with Pauli exclusion principle? Well, in the first harmonic oscillator, where the creation and annihilation operators um, follow commutation relations, there is no restriction on the number of particles in any state. If I interpret n as the number of particles, <clears throat> there is no restriction on the number of particles in any state. I can put 15 billion million particles in one state because there is nothing in the theory that gives me an upper bound on n. Something in the theory gives me a lower bound on n. It says that I cannot go beyond zero, below zero because the Hamiltonian has to be bound from below. But I can start with a state with zero particle. I can go with one particle, two, three, four, five, 15 billion quanta, nothing stops. But in the second case, where I assume that there is some uh, Hamiltonian or number operator, which is characterized by anti-commutation relations as opposed to commutation relations, I get something, the physics is fundamentally different. This is, a two, this is only a two-dimensional Hilbert space, which is characterized by n equal to zero and n equal to one. I can have a state with zero particles, I can have a state with one particle. Okay, this is what Pauli famously told us a long, long time ago. No two electrons with the same quantum numbers can occupy the given one, can occupy a given quantum state. Okay, so it tells you a fundamental connection between spin and statistics, okay, uh, which I have not derived and there is no way I can derive this. This is a very deep theorem in, in, in uh, physics really, that statistics refers to the population, right? So how you populate the states. Spin refers to something which is an internal quantum number. So there is fundamentally two different kinds of particles in the universe. The first kind of particles are called bosons whose creation and annihilation operators or raising and lowering operators in one dimensional quantum mechanics follow commutation relations. And you can bunch any number of bosons into a particular state. <clears throat> there is a different kind of particles called fermions, which is why I put an F in the number operator here. The fermions are characterized by the statistics that you can have a state with zero fermions or one fermion, but not. So commutation relations are fundamental in physics and please take them very seriously in your study, not just in this course, in all other courses. Commutation relations basically guarantee you how the particle number should look like and how the spectrum should look like and what kinds of particles that you're dealing with. Okay, this is a very important fact and uh, hopefully you understand the importance of this very simple looking commutation relations. We spent a lot of time deriving AA dagger equal to one but that is not effort spent in vain. It, it tells you something very fundamental about the universe we live in, okay? So I'll stop here. And in the next lecture, we will continue with harmonic oscillator. And I will tell you how to get the wave functions in the coordinate representation um, using the mathematics that we have uh, uh, talked about till now, okay? So I'll stop here now, and then I will go on to the wave functions in the next class. And I should remind you that you can also get the wave functions by simply solving the differential equation, which I will assign as a reading problem to you. But in this uh, course, we are following the uh, factorizable Hamiltonian AA dagger approach, which is uh, sort of neater and more intuitive.